Iran has launched a series of strikes against those it has claimed are responsible for terror attacks. What will be its implications? Oxfam's latest report paints a dismal picture of inequality in our world. What does the report say? This is the Daily Debrief. These are your stories for the day. And before we go any further, if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button. On Monday and Tuesday, Iran launched a series of missile attacks on locations in Syria, Iraq and Pakistan. Now, the attacks were reportedly against those responsible for terrorist attacks in Karman earlier this month, other attacks in December and also against an alleged Mossad operation centre. On Thursday morning, Pakistan struck back against what it said were terrorist bases in Iran. As tensions did increase across the region, what lies ahead? We go to Abdul to find out. Abdul, thank you so much for joining us. Very dramatic developments in the region, strikes by Iran and counter-strike counter by Pakistan in this case. But before we go into the details, could you maybe first take us through what Iran claims are the reasons for the strikes it conducted on Monday and Tuesday in Syria, in Syria Iraq and Pakistan? Well, Iranian uh, IRGC claims that uh, the attacks which were carried out on Monday and Tuesday uh, basically were uh, related to the recent terrorist attacks inside uh, Iran. Uh, of course, we know that there was an attack uh, in Karman where uh, uh, more than 100 Iranians were killed. Those who were gathered uh, to basically uh, commemorate the death anniversary of General Qasim Soleimani. Um, then there was another attack uh, in one of uh, the cities uh, in Iraq, Iranian Sistan, Baluchistan province, earlier in December in Rask, uh, where around 10 to 12 uh, Iranian policemen were killed. Um, these two terrorist attacks, of course, the Karman attack was uh, uh, claimed by ISIS. So uh, IRGC claimed that it attacks inside Syria, the rebel-held areas in Syria were primarily targeting the ISIS bases there. And uh, its attacks inside Pakistan were related to uh, what it called the Jas al-Adil, a terrorist organization which basically works uh, for kind of separatist reasons inside uh, Iranian uh, Sistan, Balochistan province, also active in Pakistan's Bal Balochistan province. So their bases were attacked inside Pakistan. Uh, it also uh, targeted, and that was the central, uh, you can say, uh, set of attacks which were carried out in uh, Erbil in northern Iraq, Iraqi Kurdistan, uh, where uh, Iranians claim that Mossad, uh, Iran, Israeli spy agency, has a base. And this base was used to coordinate attacks inside Iran, both the terrorist attacks and the targeted assassination of Iranian scientists or the military commanders and other top leadership. And therefore, uh, it, it has attacked. One should not forget that Iran has similar, uh, similarly attacked uh, uh, northern Iraq in 2022 as well, claiming the similar reason that uh, their Mossad has basically made some kind of center there, and that center is used against anti-Iranian activity. So this is the reason which was given by IRGC. Uh, IRGC also claimed, by the way, that the attacks are also related to uh, Mossad's coordination uh, or role in uh, uh, the assassination of top Hamas leader in Beirut uh, uh, last month, uh, 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 which basically was part of, one, one can see, the ongoing war in Gaza uh, which Israel has uh, waged since October 7th. Right, Abdul, in context, uh, now Pakistan has responded uh, with attacks of its own. So how do you see the situation uh, going from here? Well, uh, the Pakistan, of course, the, the, the kind of uh, reaction which Pakistan had made following the attacks on Tuesday uh, were, of course, uh, 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 reducing the diplomatic uh, relationship uh, kind of uh, withdrawing its ambassador from Iran and also kind of uh, 
in a way, of course, Iranian ambassador was Iranian at that time, saying that it will, he will not be allowed to come back to Pakistan soon. Uh, apart, if you see what was the statement made by uh, Pakistan's foreign ministry following the attacks on uh, uh, Thursday early morning inside Iran, uh, was basically a, 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 you can say continuation of the similar uh, statements made by the Iranian foreign ministry on Wednesday. Iranian foreign minister who was visiting the house, both the foreign minister, by the way, in the house, and it seems that they had a conversation related to it, uh, related to the attacks, and they kind of exchanged opinions about a uh, need of greater coordination among themselves to find, fight against uh, the terrorist uh, menace, bis, uh, which apparently bothers both the countries in a similar way. And, and, and in fact, both the foreign ministers have claimed that they respect each other's sovereignty and do not think this is the strikes uh, uh, inside uh, each other's territories is the right way of uh, uh, carrying out the operations against the terrorist attacks. In fact, the uh, Pakistani foreign minister uh, in a statement on Thursday has claimed that they are uh, they are already coordinating uh, with the Iranian uh, government uh, when it comes to operations in the region and they will continue to do so in the future as well. So, uh, Given the longer history between Iran and Pakistan and given the statements made by both the foreign ministers and their uh, respective uh, government agencies, it is uh, not uh, uh, likely that this uh, uh, set of uh, or, or the attacks and counterattacks will continue uh, in the in coming days. Uh, it seems that there will be some kind of reconciliation made and, and there will be, uh, uh, because that does not fit uh, in the larger uh, uh, scheme of things which Iranians are looking forward to, they do not want an, a new con confrontation uh, in uh, in the region, uh, which uh, West Asia is already uh, having so many other conflicts at this moment. There is a war in Gaza, there is um, uh, uh, responses coming from different, uh, what we call axis of uh, 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 resistance against the Israeli and U.S. presence all across the region. And then the Iranians are also basically taking uh, actions against uh, uh, the Israeli and the other uh, uh, groups which basically are creating some kind of trouble in the region. In that context, if there is another uh, front opening with Pakistan, that would not be in interest of Iran. And I think the Iranians understand it. Uh, and also Pakistan uh, one should also, by the way, that's took as a uh, uh, thing that there is an election coming in Pakistan and uh, such kind of uh, 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 conflict has a different political connotations as well. And I think this is not uh, good for both Pakistan and Iran. And they have, their statements made give indication towards that. And uh, hopefully they will have a coordinated uh, uh, step towards some kind of uh, uh, settlement of uh, this recent escalation. I think we can all hope for de-escalation also, like you said, Pakistan going towards an election and currently controlled or ruled by a caretaker government. So it's not even that a government which has a full mandate. We'll be closing, uh, tracking these issues closely and hopefully we'll have you soon. The rich keep getting richer and how? That's what the latest Oxfam report chronicles and the details are shocking. The wealth of the world's top five richest men has more than doubled since 2020 while 4.8 billion people, or 60% of humanity, have been further impoverished. The report also talks about the complete failure and even lack of policies to counter both poverty and inequality. To understand the report and why it's an indictment of the current world order, we go to Anish. Anish, Oxfam reports always a benchmark to sort of uh, understand the very glaring and you know horrendous inequality that kind of exists in today's world. So maybe first take us through what are some of the significant findings of this report. Well, it clearly etches out uh, the kind of concentration of wealth that has happened, especially since uh, 2020. Uh, we are looking at uh, the world's five richest men having accumulated or, you know, witnessing a growth in their wealth uh, by about 114 percent in the past four years. And the, the four years is quite significant because much of it was spent uh, under the pandemic. And uh, we have also spoken about this. 
uh, in during our various reports on not just the counter pandemic uh, measures, but also workers mobilizations and, uh, you know, uh, and the cost of living crisis that we have covered very extensively on the show and also on our website, which is that the wealth of the riches have grown tremendously under the pandemic. And that has come at the expense of their workers, of the countries that they're, uh, you know, operating in. And so in many of these cases, there has been no attempt to actually share that. Uh, we are seeing uh, probably like in a decade, uh, Oxfam is predicting that we might have, the world might have the first ever trillionaire in human history, but uh, we might not see uh, the end of poverty uh, even in the century uh, or, you know, maybe in the next century to begin with. So this clearly shows the kind of inequality that is running it uh, it is also showing that there there is a considerable stagnation in uh, you know counter uh, poverty efforts like the attempt to eradicate poverty much of which we must remind that it was pretty much taken up by just one country because whatever uh, poverty elevation that we have seen uh, a bulk of that came out of china and maybe india at some some extent but mo- most of the other part of the world it hasn't really uh, impacted much and we are seeing that sort of uh, concentration of wealth uh, continuing. On the other hand, there is also the imperialist angle, because what we often uh, forget is that poverty is not just relative scale. It is also something that happens in, the, in a global uh, mode of production and it, our relations of production. Uh, we are seeing a concentration of about uh, more than two thirds of the wealth in the global north, uh, specifically the West, and uh, about 74% of the world's billionaires uh, being, uh, you know, set or, you know, based out of these countries, uh, clearly shows um, that how how much of these uh, billionaires, you know, the wealthy are, you know, benefit from the kind of imperialist policies, uh, and not to uh, mention how they also control much of the world's wealth as well. And uh, we are also seeing, uh, you know, concentration of wealth in different forms. Even fiscal wealth has been concentrated uh, with, uh, you know, within a very small number of people, people that can be counted on and not just, uh, you know, we're talking, we're not talking about shareholders of corporations, we're talking about individuals. And in most of these cases, corporations uh, do control about, uh, you know, more than half of uh, the world's fiscal wealth and its resources, clearly showing the dependency that the world, like much of the dependency that uh, the world is right now arriving at is com- coming out of this sort of capitalist uh, structure that is pretty much exploitative at the very core of it. And Anish, you mentioned the lack of uh, counter-poverty measures uh, that are, you know, today there's a clear lack of it definitely, but does the report also have, uh, you know, suggestions or a roadmap into how to sort of, I say, decrease the kind of inequality we're talking about? Well, the roadmap that they are trying to, or the suggestions that we have seen in the Oxfam report pretty much uh, is nothing new. It's pretty much the same kind of, uh, you know, very liberal social democrat uh, suggestions of, you know, controlling the corporate power, controlling uh, uh, you know, uh, the inequality or the, you know, the expansion of uh, the wealth gap uh, mm-hmm. within uh, each country. Uh, revitalizing the state is something that they're talking about, which is basically to talk about how welfare state really needs to be rejuvenated. Investments need to be made so that, you know, there, there can be some level of uh, wealth redistribution. But none of this actually addresses some of the very core uh, issues in in the manner in which wealth is distributed around the world and how uh, these these, uh, individuals, these corporations work transnationally, how they influence uh, not just uh, you know, domestic policy, but also foreign policy of many of the countries, some even some of the most powerful countries in the world right now. And it doesn't really address how, uh, you know, these corporates could be reined in on a transnational level, how there needs to be. It does talk about an international cooperation that is required to actually make to make sure that this uh, sort of inequality doesn't grow, but it doesn't really give out a blueprint of how that kind of cooperation would happen. Obviously, corporate tax is one of those things that, uh, that has been talked about for a while now, uh, which will help at some level, but it is definitely something 
and even such a piecemeal thing is something that is being very strongly opposed by many parts uh, you know many corporations many powerful elite around the world and so we are looking at even such very moderate uh, talks of you know uh, controlling the wealthy uh, is being radical in many ways we do not see them even though some of these policies being uh, viable or you know or viably implemented by most of the governments that we know today so that is one of the issues like there is uh, there is the fact that these corp- these uh, wealthy do control do have political power in the manner in which they can influence policies around the world you know in in an orchestrated manner and that is something that obviously the report doesn't really address and that is something that really needs to be addressed if we need to talk about poverty eradication in the wrong run Right, Anish, thank you so much for that update. That's all we have in today's episode. We'll be back with a fresh episode tomorrow. In the meanwhile, do visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org. Follow us on all the social media platforms. And if you're watching this on YouTube, hit that subscribe button.